Hello and welcome to something new that we're trying. I'm Ben of Benji Thomas. I'm Hamza Imran of Portsmouth. I'm, I'm Eddie of House. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, we thought we'd give uh, like a sort of podcast format a bit of a go, as we're all paleontology students here at the wonderful University of Portsmouth. And um, yeah, we well, we don't want it to be like a sort of traditional podcast in a way. We're going to do a lot of, um, you know, going out and fossil hunting. Yep. We're, um, we're quite close to the Isle of Wight, so we can go and find a dinosaur whenever we're recording <laughs> fossil hunts, um, Good luck. visits to museums, doing all sorts of, of paleo media reviews, uh, talking about new discoveries, things like that. Um, and we're thinking we'll have like sort of like a, a central theme to each episode, um, going into various aspects of paleontology. Uh, we're all third year students at the university, and so we're working on our dissertation projects at the moment, and so we're actually doing our own research as well, which we can always talk about. Um, I'm currently studying an ichthyosaur specimen. Uh, I'm currently studying a crocodile from the Isle of Wight. And I've got a bucket load of shark teeth. <laughs> yeah, so if you saw the um, some of our Shark Week videos, you might remember Eddie as the shark boy yeah. <laughs> looking for teeth in London. Um, the, uh, and me, I was on the Isle of Wight with <laughs> and you. And Hamza was yeah. on, on the Isle of Wight. And uh, we actually do have a fossil hunting segment later where we go back to the Isle of Wight and uh, look fish stuff. So as you may be able to tell from the title, this episode is going to be about fish and how tetrapods, including us humans, are fish. We thought that'd be sort of like a good introduction. Confuse everyone about, for a bit. You know, how, how we got <laughs> to, to be how we are as, as people who are fish, technically. We'll get into later. Um, but yeah, we're very open to suggestions of um, improvements or like other things to do. Um, yeah. You know, please leave suggestions in the comments. Yeah. We also don't have, don't technically have like an actual name for this. We have some working titles, but um, we are looking for suggestions for names for whatever this ends up being. So please leave ideas yes. if you have any in the comments, please. and we'll we'll look through them. We, yeah, you know, if you've got some good ideas, we would very much appreciate that. We will steal it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So we we'll kind of introduce ourselves, say how we got into paleontology. I think I've kind of talked about it before. It's you know, just always been something I've been interested in ever since watching Jurassic Park yeah. and things like that. I assume it's probably the same. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you made me for put this on today. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, technically for me, it was Jurassic Park 3. That was still my first Jurassic Park movie I watched. That was very, a very weird way to do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it wasn't until years later until I watched Jurassic Park 1 and then 2. But 3 That's was good. always the one that got me into dinosaurs. I mean, it is underrated. Good film. I think Harry and his bucket full of dinosaurs as well. Oh, I love. I, I, <laughs> did you guys have the actual bucket? No, okay. no. I loved yeah. what you had you, an actual you, bucket. Yeah, and books and stuff. Oh, I think Eddie should do a, a toy yeah. review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. Oh, hang on, we got a few on display. We can get some out. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, no, I did. I I had the books. I never actually got. I the had bucket. the books as well. I had the um the space dinosaur books as well. Oh, Astro I've got all of them as well. I've got it all and all the cards. <laughs> yeah. Oh, those were great. Yeah, yeah, the, the cards you could. Oh yeah, and uh, journeys to museums. That was a mm. big inspiration. Mm. Of course, um, uh, I'm quite close to London, so I had the Natural History Museum um, in London. Of course, that was the big inspiration. Yeah, the train's not too far oh, either. I like yeah, train. That. But um, it doesn't need a bit of an update now. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, been a while. Section does need some updating, but yeah, we're well. We might be going uh, soon. Yes, um, I'm recording something. There today. might, there possibly, I'm still in works of trying to get into uh, yeah. talking to them, but we could have some behind the scenes. We'll, we'll go into that later because it's, yes. it's about something we found uh, on. Yes. Right, so we'll talk about that a bit later. But that's quite exciting. And um, yeah, I mean, we've got contacts of actual paleontologists at uh, the university and people I've been in contact with, just videos. Same here. So people we're hopefully, I've met. Yeah, yeah. hopefully going to set up quite a few interviews. Um, one of the original consultants working with dinosaurs, one of our professors. Yes, Dr. Dave Martill. He's so, a, a bit infamous. <laughs> I think that's the right word. Hopefully you can get some interviews set up with him. Quite cool. Hopefully uh, Nash as well. That. Darren Nash, Nash we're in contact with. Um, Dean Lomax. We have the, uh, probably the most famous paleontologist in the 21st century right now. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Nizar <laughs> Ibrahim. So, yeah. um, He's we also can, one we of can our try and get him. He's one of our... Yeah. Uh, vertebrate, um, vertebrate paleontology. Yeah, professors. I think if we try now, we'll get him for two years in advance. <laughs> we, we, that might work. Yeah, hopefully we can do some uh, some 
interviews about Spinosaurus. That would be a massive yeah. dream for me. Yeah. Um, shall we get into the fish stuff? Yes, let's. Because we've got some interesting things to tell you all about fish. Um, now, as you may or may not know, humans, us, are fish ourselves. Um, so what is a fish? Well, quite a loose definition, and there's a lot of things that can be considered a fish. Um, it's kind of, the, the actual term itself is sort of paraphyletic, which is a term that means it includes the ancestors of a certain group of animals, but not all of the descendants. So it excludes uh, tetrapods, the four-limbed vertebrates that we are ourselves a member of. Yeah, a good example is like saying, oh, all birds are dinosaurs, but not all dinosaurs are birds. Yeah, exactly. If that helps explain what paraphyletic means. <laughs> yeah. And they have paraphyletic groups inside them as well, which yeah. doesn't help. <laughs> Very so, confusing phylogeny. I did actually find a decent definition of fish is, if you can switch to the screen, from the Evolution Berkeley site. Oh, I do um, love that one. It's very useful, and yeah, it's just got, you know, the, the basic definition of all fish have a brain protected by a brain case and an obvious head region with eyes, teeth, organs. And then it's very, fishes, very loose. Exactly, because you have <laughs> all these exceptions to all these other things. So not all of them are vertebrates, because you have uh, things such as the lampreys, yeah. uh, um, hagfishes, hagfishes, which are technically craniates, yeah. yes. not vertebrates. Um, not all fish horses. Live in water. Yeah, they're acting up to origins. Right, oh, okay. Yeah, they look really strange, though, so <laughs> I can't blame you. And, yeah, so th things that could be considered fish aren't actually necessarily, but so, like I said, uh, you know, hagfish, lampreys, the haiku ichthys, haiku ichthys, that one, uh, from the Cambrian of China, it's a craniate, so it has a nose cord and a distinct head, but no true backbone, but it is classified as a chordate. Foods, vertebrates and tunicates, which are the closest relatives. Um, yeah, so notochord is something most all fish have. That was part of the definition. Well, it's essentially like the, the step to an actual spinal cord and yeah. spine. Yeah, step one of how to make a vertebrate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a cord. kind of flexible rod that acts like a backbone. Um, and we still have them early stages of our embryonic development. Um, me. Okay, I'll try and be louder. <laughs> um, Shout into it. Yeah, so we, we as humans do have them early on in our embryonic development. Uh, but most, most things that are fish are going to be vertebrates. Um, so you're going to talk about when fish first Yeah, evolved. so uh, it passes on to me. It's a bit of a, a long um, history, how fish is evolved. So we have to set back the scene. We go back to the Paleozoic, the early Paleozoic. Um, some of the first group of fishes are known as the agnathostomes, which means uh, no jaws. But then um, there has been development in the Paleozoic. So we're looking from the Cambrian to the Devonian. Uh, it was diverse. So um, you have, it's quite limited, but the fossils are there. Just more research needs to be done. Um, it's about 500 million years ago, so going, going back quite far into the Paleozoic, the, um, paleontologists speculate that the, fish, the evolution of fishes originated from the closely related organisms like Pekaya, Hycoichthys, and Michaelomingia. Yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs> No hesitation, that was great. But um, these evidence have been backed up by the notochord, as Ben said, found in another specimen, Pekaya. Um, from the yes, from the yep. Burger Shell. Uh, Burger Shell, Canada. Um, this may have been the earliest form of a vertebral column. It's still speculative on where it might be um, Hycoichthys or Pekaya having the earliest form. But um, more research needs to be done on earlier fishes to fully understand where we came from. And plus, Pekaya has a very, as Ben said, with the definition of fishes, it's very loose. So you need mm. to have a head, you need to have a tail, you need to have those basic characteristics. And Pakai actually has that. Pakai actually has a head and a tail. So, so would you say it's got material beyond the anus? Yes, <laughs> as, as Doctor as Doctor Martil would say, there is material beyond the anus. So that is one of the definitions <laughs> of it's craniates or vertebrates. I think it's craniates. craniates. Yes. Yeah. But um, yeah. So some modern um, you have some modern examples of jawless fishes. 
as Ben also said earlier, was the hagfishes and lampreys. But they're very different from the Ignatha stones. So, um, but now moving into more of the animals that have skeletal remains, or harder skeletal remains, are the conodonts. They're a group representing... Oh, I already said that. But yeah, <laughs> these, yeah, so the conodonts. Um, these, fossils, these fossil organisms have been found in rocks dating to the late Cambrian to the end of the Triassic. The fossils are found in only, they're found as small teeth, teeth-like structures, so you'll have to dissolve a lot of rock material to actually find these. Um, some soft body preservation has been found in um, conodonts, and we actually... Very rarely. Very, yeah. very rare yeah, there. In the 80s, we finally found one. That yes. Yeah. Um, I think that was actually in the UK. Yeah, it was. Um, up north, they found one. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all up north. Um... Yeah, but after the Cambrian periods, uh, ex- uh, after the P- Cambrian period of ex- explosive evolutionary change in the Ordovician period, Jules fishes began to radiate, appearing more and more. This period introduced clades falling into groups of um, astra- astropeda? Astraspida, yeah. Astraspida <laughs> and Aranapsida? Wait. Arandaspid? And a, yeah, how do you, how I'm not familiar with those actually? Yeah, yeah. Um, small fishes, but with distinct features such as the pointed plates coming off their tail and bony skulls. Now, from that, we're going to go into the jawed fish, jawed vertebrates. So, this is the gonna, this is going to introduce all the fishes and tetrapods. So, the nephistomes, which happened, which arose during the early Silurian. The evolution of the jawed um, the jaw allowed them to hunt and feast on prey easily. The early Devonian started to become more and more diverse, these jawed vertebrates. We might see some, I think, Dunkleosteus will be part of this group. What, placoderms? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we see yeah. them. Arthrodiorism. Um, then um, some examples include, as Eddie said, placoderms, the armored, armored monsters, chondrichthys, and, canth- and canthodians. Um, ost- and, ost- uh, and canthodians, the osteichthys, which are the bony uh, bodied fishes. And um, looking at the osteoichthys, which originated in the light, so late Silurian, this introduced two clades. This is the An- Actinopterygia and the Sarcopterygia. So the Actinopterygia are the raid fin fishes. The Sarcopterygia, these are the load fin fishes. And um, looking at the Sarcopterygia, they're very interesting because we see more of interesting groups like Acast. Oh, gosh, I'm going to be Actinopterygia. Actinistia, which is the group of coelacanth, so the living fossil, as some Supposedly, would say. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Although um, they have evolved a lot. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, we should probably go into living fossils. Or something. Yeah, that'd be. A cool yeah, episode. that. Um, I know the NHM have a coelacanth. Yeah. Um, we, there's someone on our course studying coelacanth as yes. well. So yeah, we we, we also yeah. had the opportunity to probably see one of the largest coelacanth fossils. Um, Dr. Dave Martill and Dr. Roy Smith from the University of Portsmouth wrote a paper back in 2020. Of the, the lung. Yeah, of the lung. Yeah, lung. So a lung was a, so a really big, weird bit of bone, you could, you could call it. A ossified lung was found on a block, a block of pterosaur bones. Well, and they thought it was pterosaur originally. Yes. And then... Until they looked at it properly, yeah. and they noticed that it wasn't just a big block of bone. There were ossified plates on there. So they took the, they got a chainsaw. They took the <laughs> the fossil off the plate of um, pterosaur bones, and they actually found out that it's actually a coelacanth lung. So there's only been this ever discovered in the world to be this big. So Dr. Dave Martin and Roy, um, Smith, Dr. Roy Smith, think that the animal may have measured to about three point five to five meters long. This animal is called Morsonia, and it will pro- it's probably the biggest um, Sarcopterygii um, mm. we but know. Isn't it one of the last representatives from the Mesozoic? Yes. I, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very it's, late Cretaceous. Yeah. It's a mass yeah. restricting, so it's found in the phosphates of uh, Morocco. So um, we, we have some amazing photos of that fossil. Um, we have to show them. We will yeah. definitely have to show them off. Yeah, uh, we can we link, think... link the paper as well. It's yes, of course. Very, very interesting. We think the fossil has been... Uh, it's back to um, uh, Morocco now. So once, as paleontologists should, once fossil is described, it should go back to the mm. uh, royal countries and um, back into collections. But yeah, moving back on to fishes. Um, so yeah, we talked about the... Coelacanths. Coelacanths. 
So now, um, <laughs> yeah, now in the yeah, early yeah. but now in the early Devonian period, the Sarcopterygii were very diverse. But it was thought to be a subclade of Tristic Noctridae. Tristic Noctridae. Tristic Noctridae may have helped the evolution of tetrapods, such as Eusinopteron, a Sarcopterygii found in the late Devonian of Canada. Um, now it's highly accepted that Eusphenoptron gave rise to Pandarichthys, then to Thalic, Acanthosterga, Ichthyosterga, and Tulopoton. Um But now um, Eddie is going to talk about... Oh, no. I'm not talking about Oh, we're not. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, so now we're going to define what characteristics of a fish. Yeah, so that's another thing that has lots, lots of exceptions to it, because you can't say they all live in water. Some of them don't live in water. Um, like us. I'll try my best. <laughs> And um, yeah, you know, another defining characteristic of most what you would consider fish is that they breathe primarily with gills rather than lungs, but then you've got the lung fish. Well, and you've got um, this placoderm that had lungs as well, Bophriolepis. It was mm. a really um, successful placoderm. Okay. Yeah, that had lungs. Uh, had as well. lungs. <laughs> so, so it's yeah, not even can't. the Sarcopterygian, specifically lungfish, Adam. Yeah, and the, the lungfish lungs themselves are actually quite complex, homologous with um, tetrapod lungs, and they're not just like modified gas bladders. Uh, which is quite interesting. You have the paired limbs yeah. in the form of fins to aid in locomotion. And that's interesting because we see some reptiles with their paired fins, such as the um, plesiosaurs, pliosaurs, yep. the ichthyosaurs, mm. mosasaurs. So, I mean, yeah, they're also sort of homologous with the, some of the sarcopterygia. Yeah. I mean, we are, are sarcopterygia. We're getting, we're getting to that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll get into it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then being unable to regulate their own internal body temperatures, but then... Obviously, you know, you have tuna yeah, uh, retaining some body heat. They're covered um, in scales to protect their bodies, as we know. Um, yeah. We know coelacanths had quite thick scales. They were um, um, half bony, half enamel. Yeah, well, a lot of scales are like that. They've got a pulp cavity, dentine surrounding them. So that's what a teeth are thought to be derived from scales. like Because um, you've got the jaw, which is most likely come from the gill rakers. That was modified into the jaw, and then scales. Teeth, I mean, they, they literally do have the same cross section as teeth, it's quite mm -hmm. cool. Like, you've got placoid scales, which sharks have, cosmoid, which is what the sarcopters have, yeah. Well, cosmoid is what early sarcopters yeah. had, and they've, they've modified them now. Yeah. Cool now. Yeah, the, the lateral line detection system is another interesting bit of fish anatomy. Uh, it's, it's just it's like sensory scales that kind yeah, of like so, all down their body, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they can... sense vibrations, yeah, and stuff like that. Although it, something we'll talk about later is, um, it's only useful in the water. Like basically, once uh, tetrapods decide to step out, it's like, well, it does nothing now. Yeah. <laughs> even even though a lot of them will have a buried la lateral line canal, but it's basically useless once you're out. Um, I don't know if we include this really. Just. There's a lot of different. Yeah, I think I, men I, I mentioned them. So yeah, so conodonts kind of, kind of quite interesting. Um, yeah, something I wanted to quickly highlight though was a new series of like four papers um, of discoveries from China, Silurian fish. Um, I covered it in the Seven Days of Science episode a few weeks ago, but that basically like confirms that um, a lot of different fish groups had been around in the early Silurian. Well, um, they were quite diverse at that time. Yeah, we had like individual scales that possibly indicated that they yeah. had originated earlier, but now we've fully got... Now we've got the, the, good the organism of those scales. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I did want to mention, um, as we sort of skipped it, because uh, I want to talk a little bit about Acanthodians. Mm. So those are like spiny sharks, right? And now, originally, they weren't really sure how they placed, whether they were a clade or a grade, and whether they spread out all over and just had sort of convergent features. Although now it's actually seen that they're actually really important because they're on the stem lineage to chondrichthys, uh, chondrichthys being the cartilaginous fishes. Um, and just to clarify, um, they, chondrichthys are vertebrates, but they secondarily lost essentially loss of um, bone. Yeah. But, um, and they ossified the verts, didn't they? Yeah, well, it's basically they've got cartilage, but they calcify, and then in the uh, head they have... Uh, Prismatic cartilage instead of sort of dermal bone. And um, yeah, acanthodians are really interesting because, like, you, you remember with the hybridon stuff, like, yeah. they've got spines. And I mean, you look at acanthodians, they're covered in them. They've got 
dorsal ones, pelvic ones, pectoral ones. Um, some of the early ones have even got spines on their belly. If it's only their anal fin that doesn't have hmm. spines, and um, yeah, they're they're really important because obviously they're around the linear uh, time when jaws first evolved. And, yeah, uh, they're, yeah, they've got <laughs> jaws and they're pretty early on. Uh, what else is there? Oh, they've got huge eyes as well. It's like, it's crazy. Look at their fossil. They look really weird. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, which means some people think that they lived in um, like deep open water. Mm. And there's marine or freshwater ones, but by the Carboniferous, mm. they're, they're mostly only. So you were saying the animals, uh, the uh, Canthodians with the giant eyes. Yeah. What era was that again? Um, uh, I think they appeared either in Silurian, and then they went out in. See, that's interesting because you can imagine Carb- if no, they're going to be quite deep dwelling animals, you can imagine they're trying to evade other predators because um, when an animal goes quite deep, they're looking for food, of course. But then you're out at the same time you're trying to, you're going to try and um, evade other predators. So that's a really, really well done structure they've developed. Well, they're fairly big as well. Like um, get like a couple of years long. Okay, so tetrapod <laughs> evolution. I mean, this is where it all gets confusing and why it's all paraphyletic. Yeah. Because this is where we start talking about how fish invaded land. And the definition for fish is a four limbed vertebrate with digits. So it covers everything. <laughs> and um, so we know that the uh, tetrapods evolved from sarcopterygians, as mentioned before, specifically riffidistians. It, at the moment, there's three living groups of Sarcopter regions. You've got the lungfish, the rifidus, cedar camps. It was debated a while between them um, which group did we arise from. Some people thought lungfish because of the lungs, obviously. Uh, but it turns out rifidusians have most homologous bones in our in their limbs, and we can see that in the gene five hox D, which controls the le- development of the distal elements in the fish fins and in tetrapod wrist bones, which also touches on Sonic the Hedgehog. And oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <great. laughs> yeah. But I mean, like any good evolutionary tale, why? Why would you? Why would you do this? And it was originally thought that um, they evolved limbs so they could get out of like stagnant pools because it'll seem that there were sometimes t- times of drought in uh, Devonian because you got mm. red sandstones and stuff like that. So they thought, oh, they hop from pond to pond, and that's why they did it. But we actually know now that the development of a limb happened while they were still very, very aquatic, like this. They developed the limb well before they decided to go on land. Um, so it might be that it still needs to be more research on this, but it might have been like they were using it to push vegetation out of the way because they were living in very dense yeah, vegetated areas, like shallow areas. So, like, yeah. kind of using them to but, drag themselves along. Yeah. A lot in of the fisher pods were found in like meandering rivers, yeah, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, what why else would you uh go onto land? Like, so you've got unoccupied niches, so. Land was basically uncharted territory. I mean, you got plants there, you got insects, but apart from that, I mean, nothing else is living there. Mm. It's, it's, and you know, with the Devonian age of fishes, I mean, the fish was hugely, like, hugely diverse at that point, and you know, lots of competition. So it made sense to possibly explore that. Yeah. Um, and it's it's an example of uh, like exaptation as well, where they already have these sort of basic limbs that are good at you know moving vegetation. And then they can be, it's like, yeah, they can then be used for something else, which is yeah, that happens a lot. Walking Le- on land, less predation as well. I mean, yeah. hell, we mentioned earlier, donkey osteos. I don't want that thing chasing me. I'm getting, I'm getting <laughs> out. I'm getting out. Um, what else is there? More resources available. Yeah, so you, insects are pretty tasty. <laughs> Ferns are tasty. I'll have a bit of that. Um, and yeah, I think that's mostly why you transitioned. To yeah. Us. But yeah, it's just completely new uncharted territory, and as life will, life will fill those niches. But how do you get onto land then? Now, a lot of people think the main issue is breathing air, but as we've mentioned before, we they already had lungs. Lungfish gone, placoderms gone. To be honest, when you look at early tetrapods, they couldn't breathe air much better than fish. Um, but one of the main things is support, because when a fish is in water. It literally weighs zero. I mean, you see when whales get beached, they literally crushed under their own mm. weight because the main force on land is gravity. And so you need support structures to hold you up. But also, 
you need rib cages. I'm, I'm going to do a lot of this. It, it helps because <laughs> it's homologous features. Yeah. You need rib cage to hold need your organs, organs in because otherwise you stand, stand up, up and it's just, it's, just it's all coming out. Um, yeah, what obviously. else do you need? So we said support, support locomotion. locomotion. Now that's really different from water, obviously, because um, you, you know you go from smoothly gliding around with your fins, and now you've suddenly got this jerking motion. Mm. Like, and also, like, if you look at fish, so their shoulder girdles come back like this, and their fins point back because they've got like 20, 25 degrees of movement in use fenopteron. You, you have, have to bring, bring that shoulder, shoulder girdle forwards, bring the humerus sort of sideways and down. Now it's a bit different because we stand up and stuff. Um, yeah, and you, you you'll bring all of this down and uh, you have turn this all into a support structure because before it's just direction and propulsion, but now you've mm. actually got it's got to hold you up as well. Um, yeah, and it's a little while to do. Uh, what else is there? Respiration. So we talked about breathing a bit. Now they already had lungs, but there's a couple different ways of doing that. Early tetrapods and you see some amphibians doing that today is buccal pumping where you literally force the air like ram it into your mouth and then pulling up the mouth cavity is forced into the lung so it's a bit like <gasps> it's it's it has to do. that was a great demonstration yeah Can we see that again? we should uh... yeah <laughs> we should get eddie to be dressed up as one of these things yeah and then you've got costal ventilation which is what all cool people do uh it's basically the ribs and lungs expanding and muscles there pulling in and out much nicer. I know some snakes do that. What? There's a snake that um what breathes? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, when you're talking about ribs, I don't know why I've just brought this up. There's a snake that can actually extend its ribs by falling down. So like when when oh, it needs well, to go like when it glides, Yeah, so it gl stuff. technically glides, but it glides really badly and yeah. it, the goal of it is just to get from one high place to the bottom of the ground, but instead of falling at such a force breaks or like expands its ribs to mm. glide itself down but it still hits the ground as hard as it can okay well back to <laughs> sorry yeah so we got support we covered locomotion we covered respiration feeding i mean you've got to now be able to sort of lunge forwards and grab the prey i mean so you look at fishes their shoulder girdles are still sort of interconnected with their heads and there's not as much motion there so you have to be able to disconnect that so you're not turning your entire body when you need to turn your head and grab something like it's just much more mobile so if it wires uh you got yeah disconnect the shoulder girdle and all that stuff um sensory systems so obviously i said earlier lateral line canal is not going to work anymore um eyesight was a big one they upgraded on land that much bigger eyes mm. um apparently some books i've read said their sense of smell might have also gotten better like but how don't would really you have much evidence for that? Yes, need brain case, yeah. yeah. Um, another one is that, but their hearing would have been really bad on the land because so the stapes is derived from um, um, bones in the jaw, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it was just too big in early tetrapods, like it couldn't really pick up high frequency sounds. So good eyesight, good sense of smell, but not great hearing. Um, reproduction. So you got to find a way of internal reproduction. I mean. A lot of amphibians lay their eggs in the water and basically go, f they betray their ancestry really because mm. they start off as tadpoles, which are basically like fish, I yeah. guess. <laughs> and then they slowly become more terrestrial. But I, to be honest, one of the most important things I think was water balance. I think that's a problem that took a long time for tetrapods to fix because basically, is when you're in water, I mean, you're trying to stop the water always coming into you, like. Osmosis and all, I'm sure you all know how that works. <laughs> High to low gradient. Um, but obviously on land, there's a real problem with desiccation, drying out. I mean, you've got all these open spaces or or orifices that it's just going to cause evaporation and you really don't want desiccation. It's bad. <laughs> uh, so you've got to find a way of um, yeah, stopping that. So um, a lot of, that's why a lot of amphibians stay by the water. They, they have yeah. um, semi-permeable skin, use mucuses. And it's not really until like reptilian morphs sort of come along and they keratinize their skin that it really solves that. Yeah, and the egg issue as well. Having yeah. eggshell to keep that. that well, in. that's why, yeah, they lay yeah. in water originally. But we'll get into amniotes in a different <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, so we covered um, what you actually need. So we're going to talk a little bit about use of again. So, Riffidistium, and to be honest, it looks like a fish, it walks like a fish, 
It talks like a fish. <laughs> so what's so special about it? Well, it shares many homologous structures with early tetrapods in the skull, especially the distinct bones in the fin. So you've got a uh, humerus, ulna radius, um, well, ulna, ulna radio, radii, and, um, but you don't really have much of the hand per, way, uh, per se. Uh, distal elements hadn't really evolved yet. But they are very similar. Like You, you can look at them, and especially if you color code the bones, um, you can really see how similar they go. And when you're looking at some good images of uh, their lineage, you can really see how that evolves. Mm. Uh, but apart from that, it's it's just looking, a fish. Yeah. It it looks <laughs> it's very aquatic. It doesn't do much else. But about ten million years later, um, from the de- late Devonian, you got Tiktaalik. Now I'm sure many of you have heard about that. It's still a Sarcopterygian. It's not really a tetrapod yet. I mean, some people call it fishapod, which is quite a good term for these lot, to be honest. Uh, it's still got gills. It's still got those cosmoid scales like coelacanths and stuff, and it still has fin rays. It has a flattened triangular head, which is much better on land because, well, if you fall over on land, like like if you lay down on land, if you're shaped like a fish, you're going to roll. If you've got a flat triangular head, you're not going to roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's got a functioning wrist, actually, now, so that's quite good. Uh, it's got a mobile neck, so it can move all this going on, but I don't think the shoulder girdle was fully disconnected yet, and it had a modified ear region. Uh, its fins could be used to swim, move on land, but not for very long. I mean, but it it, it really is a momentous fossil. Like it was hailed as the missing link. Mm, because, yeah. Like you, you know, you go from Euphenopteron to like a reptile. This really shows how some of those bones started to develop. These aren't, these fossils were literally the um the key we needed to figure out where we came from. Yeah, and then ten million years later, you got uh Ichthyostega. So this is a lot broader. It's got a shorter skull. And its eyes are further back in the head. Um, the pectoral girdle now is actually separate, so that's this lot. Um, and it's got unusually massive ribs, which might have been to help it um, sort of waddle. Well, no, not really waddle. It more sort of, when I was on land, it was quite ungraceful. <laughs> um, it was a bit like a seal, so that might have helped support yeah. its organs. Because um, back legs, like while they look pretty big, but they weren't not functional they were not, yet. They were not good for at all, mostly just great big paddles. Uh, pe- the pelvic girdle supports um, the posterior trunk, tra- uh, trunk and tail and holds the acetabula of the femurs, but it st- is, like I said, still built for swimming rather than walking, and it would have looked pretty silly, a bit like a seal. Um, so yeah, it does seem that while developing limbs didn't take that long, it took a while to actually make them weight-bearing and walk on land. Uh so they spent most of their time underwater, probably using their limbs to kick along the bottom. Maybe a bit like a hippo. Mm. Um, and then hauling themselves occasionally on land, um, using their forearms to hold, help hold them up. Mm. Yeah, but that, that was one of the main things. Like, breathing was not an issue, like most people think. It was weight-supporting. Weight um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about Kikitania. You also wanted to talk about yeah, that as well. It's, yeah. Because that's a fairly recent discovery, isn't it's it? It's an amazing discovery because it's, it's just, just, it's what everyone wants to do every Monday morning is just, just hoped we never came out the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this so. This is the one to blame. Yes. <laughs> now, this is the one to praise. If only oh, we evolved yeah. from okay. Kikitania. Yeah. But yeah, so this is, a, it's aroundish the same time as the Catholic, but it's a lot smaller. It's like 30 centimeters. And. Well, you know, all all these boys were going on to land, you know, they were trying to get those insects. But he was like, nah, I'm staying. He decided to go back. So while it still got some of those de- um, developmental parts of the limbs, it didn't have the musculature around it to support land movement at all. Um, and it was basically a full-time oceanic dweller. And, um, yeah, it was actually really good at swimming. Like, I think they said, because of it developed those limbs already a bit. They made really good paddles, mm. possibly for swimming in open water. Um, yeah, and it was, yeah, yeah. Jaws that could suck in prey as well, so like suction feeding. Yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, and fang-like teeth. Um, but yeah, the humerus of Kikitania uh, is very different to Tectalic though, because it's quite smooth and uh, boomerang shaped. So while uh, tetrapods made their humerus longer and straighter, more robust. Uh, this side, nah, going boomerang shaped, and that's why it could not support itself on land at all. Um, 
this was really interesting when it was first discovered. So when they were preparing a camp for you know, you assume, okay, it's going to have five fingers like we all do. Everything's got that. Mm. Except it didn't. It had eight digits on its um, huh. uh, hands and feet. So See, it, that yeah, would it's... help with the paddle movement because border surface area. Yeah. More, but um... It's just interesting to think about because Oof. obviously, like, well, it would have changed everything about us because w- if we had extra fingers, we'd... <laughs> well, think about maths and all that. We would look yeah, like, based um... on like five. Yeah. You know, basis of five fingers. Could we look like the mer people from Primeval? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of genetic stuff behind that with Sonic Hedgehog mm. and um, the Hox genes. But another thing it showed was um, that like the digits aren't individually mapped to certain genes. It's all controlled by the same stuff. <laughs> oh, God, the rain started again. <laughs> um, Classic. <laughs> uh, at least it's not as bad as it was earlier. <laughs> oh, well, actually, I'm about to eat my words, aren't I? Uh, I think you yeah, are. So, I like the early carboniferous. Basal tetrapods that could walk on land had appeared. And, and recent discoveries from Scotland, so pederpes and all that lot, mm. have filled the Roma's gap with new species as they took advantage of the new niches available to them. Albeit they're still, still pretty rare, I'd mm. say. Um, yeah, do, do we, we want to talk about Roma's gap? Yeah, yeah that's something I wanted to mention because yeah. I've been planning a video on, <laughs> on this topic for a while and it's take, taken a while, haven't got there yet. But Roma's gap is essentially like this gap obviously in the fossil records 14 million years yeah so from the late devonian to the early carboniferous uh this guy alfred Romer, a very famous paleontologist in the 20th century he noticed that there wasn't like there weren't good fossils documenting kind of the the transition from from all of these like still aquatic tetrapods to the fully terrestrial ones mm. that lived in the carboniferous and so yeah there are lots of ideas kind of uh given for why this sudden like low yeah. diversity existed and one of them the main one was um they thought there was very high oxygen levels in the devonian um but then after mass extinction there was very low oxygen and so there was not that much tetrapod diversity in early, early carboniferous a bit of a pause you'd say yeah but then there are also these studies that found like the complete opposite to be true and that actually oxygen levels were a lot lower at yeah. times earlier on in the devonian than they were in this gap um and then yeah basically all these all these discoveries started to be made in Scotland and a, a locality in Canada that actually found... Um, so Pederpes was the first one to kind of really fill in the gap. Um, and now loads of others from this, uh, these sites in Scotland that date to exactly when the gap was have shown. Actually, tetrapods were pretty diverse. So the gap has been filled in. It doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. But it's still an interesting bit of paleontological yeah. history. It is, yeah, I think it's still slightly hypothesized that High oxygen levels may have encouraged diversification, but it's, yeah. it's one of those things where, where people are saying nowadays, look, no matter what the oxygen levels were, those niches were going to be exploited either mm. way. Like, it, it was too good mm. to do. But yeah, we could talk about Pederpes a little bit. <laughs> it, it's, it's a pretty cute little thing, to be honest. That's a terrifying thing. Well, I think it's cute. Oh, that's adorable. Yeah. I, I, yeah, drawing that thing was not fun. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, it's about one meter long. And yeah, it's got some really cool features that show that transition between being an aqua- aquatic tetrapod to being much more terrestrial. Like, it's got a um, feet that face forwards rather than to the side. I mean, it's just so much easier. Um, so it's much more adapted to terrestrial locomotion. It's got a triangular narrow skull. So that actually shows it was better for hostile ventilation, what I said earlier about the ribs and muscles doing that, than buccal pumping. Because, you know, you look at a frog, that's got a big wide mouth. That helps with the ramming that air in. Mm. <gasps> <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's not going to be able to do that with a narrow triangular skull. So that's really cool because it shows by then fossil ventilation had at least appeared. It's still got primitive uh, palate teeth, so that'd be teeth up there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the lateral line canal, which would have been buried. And it's got ilium. Um, what, the, what the hell did I write there? I don't know, it's all over the place. Oh, um, where did you write that? Yeah, not to know. I got alien written in there for no reason. <laughs> alien, um, but math derived math. Yeah. Too. Anyway, <laughs> well, that's a bit off on the spot. Oh yeah, so it's got the the five. I remember reading. It's got like five functional digits on all of its limbs, but it's got so it's got six digits on its hands. Yeah, yeah, but one of them, it's yeah, really six reduced. one is reduced. So it's like essentially five functional. Yeah, which, oh, so, so it shows good. by then the the five hand digit yeah. starting to appear. Um. Oh yeah, this was it. Um, 
So it had really derived massive teeth on the maxilla. So if you look at a skull, like side on view, mm. you've got right at the front, that's going to be the pre maxilla. Yeah. And then sort of the next bit that bears teeth on the upper jaw, that's the maxilla. Okay, look at the skull. <laughs> um, yeah, for the rest of the calmness, they just completely took off. They diversified oh, amazingly. Oh, is... We could pull up that, actually. Yeah, this is. We're going to. Quick tangent. We're going to go on to <laughs> Shubin. <laughs> Shubin Lab. Oh, Neil Shubin. Yeah, it's his oh, actual yeah. thing. It's really good. Oh, awesome. So he's post. He's got um, all these images available of the specimens. Um, yeah, we can pull them up, can't we? Um, yeah, CT scan. Oh, they look absolutely fantastic. Um, and they're they're available online for free. I mean, this this is how science should be done. Yeah, like, exactly. This is how paleontology and just how... science in general must be done. That's the thing we're saying nowadays. Science communication is really important. That's look, a nice. That's it's, a nice. It's available for printing print well. and awesome. Yeah, it's for free, man. It's great. So you know, have a look at it. Yeah, because it's a fantastic specimen, and obviously, well, the tic there as well. well so let's have a look at that reconstruction. The, the top. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's cool. Lovely. Yeah, so you can sort of see, like, its limbs, like, it's got these really broad paddles, I and mean, then I think, uh, is that tic-tac below it? Yeah, 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 it looks yeah. like it. So you can see the size difference as well. Yeah. For some reason, just the way the the eyes are, it looks like it has a third eye just towards its left. Hey, the pinu eye. <laughs> yeah. we could, no, we'll talk about the pinu eye when we talk about um, mammals. Yeah. And the yeah. Fur and all that. Oh, yeah. That's a... Uh... As a whole thing but so neil shubin is the author of your inner fish i want to read yeah. that book it looks really I, good. I need to read it as well i've been meaning to for a while but yeah. it's he's done a lot of work on um early vertebrates yeah early early tetrapod evolution yeah that's really cool yeah anyway back to, switch back now <laughs> back to what we were doing <laughs> um yeah so they radiated into 40 families which split into back tracker morphs so those are your amphibians mm. now Amphibians is a weird term because you can either say it includes all modern, like it's only the yeah. modern ones, or you can make it to include all the stem yeah, amphibians like as well. Stem bundles. Yeah, like things. them. We should do an episode on them. Yeah. I've been reading about Coolosuchus a lot recently. And then you've got reptilian morphs, which is where your amniotes would have come from, where yeah. they're fully independent from. We definitely but, need to do a video yeah, on that. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like a lot of stuff. We'll talk about amniotes later because <laughs> their evolution is very interesting as well. Very um, long as well. <laughs> in terms of um, sort of where you find good information, yeah, you said you're in a fish. A yeah. book I very much recommend is uh, Vertebrate Paleontology by Benton. He's done some well in terms of just general paleontology. Yeah, I've been using he's done it a some lot. Great stuff. It was a, we use it a lot. A lot, for a lot of year. information. And another good there. place, us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we'll probably get things wrong. But yes, we'll, we'll make sure to correct ourselves in yeah. in future videos. Episode. But it's, it's science, paleontology. <laughs> it's constantly changing, and people are always getting things wrong. Yes, yeah. we didn't. We never knew about the four sharks from the Silurian. Well, that's the, yeah, but that's new, the, the, the new discovery. Yeah, the new yeah. discovery. Not yeah, one of them was a shark. Yeah, one. Well, sorry, yeah, one of them. Yeah, but oh, that's interesting, though. Oh, so we were going to answer the question basically. Does this mean humans are fish? And also, are whales, whales fish? fish? Because are people often... Long story short, fish? yes. Yes to both. <laughs> not, okay, that's right, not that's the it. See you, see you yeah. later. <laughs> End the video there. Yeah. But um, we explained paraphyletic. Yeah, so I kind of went into what paraphyletic means, where it's, you know, a clade that doesn't include... So a clade is just a grouping of organisms. They're all related to each other and descend from a common ancestor. If it's paraphyletic, it excludes certain descendants. So like the example of dinosaurs like it should include birds and if it doesn't then it's paraphyletic they are descendants of a group of dinosaurs so therefore they are dinosaurs so you can say the same with with tetrapods we are tetrapods tetrapods evolved from fish therefore tetrapods are fish therefore we are fish and whales are also tetrapods you know they went out of the water and then back into it but they're still tetrapods and therefore yeah really good fish. fossil for that is, um mm. Sorry, I was going to say a really good fossil for the um, coming out of the water is uh, Pachycetus. Um, going in the water, you mean? Going in the water, yes, yeah. You got Pachycetus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but one thing I've always loved when I watched I watched this documentary years ago, and I see love. If you look at a whale skeleton, look towards the tail, or not all the way towards the tail. Oh, look, it's got tiny little pelvis, hasn't it? It's got tiny yeah. little so funny. bones on the side because those are the remains, the ancestral bones of what the limbs, where the back legs would have been. And apparently they're still used for anchoring um, genital muscle. 
Yeah, so um, yeah. if you if if you're ever in London, go like have a look at the mm. go look at the Blue Whale in the NHM. Oh yeah, um, you will see the bones there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to clarify. So the opposite of paraphyletic is monophyletic. So yeah. that is where you're including everything. Yeah. So that's so if you want, so clades by definition are monophyletic, yeah. where all of the descendants from a single common ancestor are included. So dinosaurs. We, we should pull up birds. a picture of the um, family tree. Circle it. Of uh oh monophyly. Just a, any any family tree and uh let's do Dinosaurus and Baryonyx uh Dinosaur game, do that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Uh yeah, yeah, Wikipedia's like good, pretty good. Uh, Wikipedia. They often have good like phylogenies, like alternate versions and Greg such. Paul. Did you say song. Greg Paul? No. <laughs> well, let's not go into that right now. Please cut that out. Please. No, that's, <laughs> don't put that in. Rolling. Okay, so apparently I can't find Just go one. look up ichthyosaur phylogeny. Because oh, you know your no, ichthyosaur phylogeny. That. Here we go. Alright, here we go. Yeah, okay. Please switch to that. Why is there a kiwi there? This is a clade. Megalosauroidea. Yeah. So monophyletic includes everything descending from this common ancestor. If for some reason you want to exclude Spinosauridae, that's weird. Why then it's paraphyletic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Basically, that's, that's how, you, cool. how you define it. Yeah. Um, we're getting distracted by dinosaurs. We're meant to be talking about fish. Dinosaurs are fish. What Don't you that? remember? That's we're... true. That's true. We did just go over that. We're not getting into this now. Oh no, you're what right. That's weird. Well, it's not near the nature itself. That's. Oh, gulicho. Gulicho. How you say it? Anyway, back all to right, yeah. This is all getting cut out, so <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, yeah. So basically, if we want, if we want fish to be an actual taxonomic term for a clade, which it it isn't usually used as because it's no. too broad of a term anyway. But you know, if everything I that think a fish don't exist as well. <laughs> yeah, <'cause laughs> it's it's kind of easier if you just don't use it as a a technical term and more like a casual, just anything that sort of looks like. But if you wanted it to be monophyletic, then you should include human and all tetrapods. Oh yeah, so to all the fishermen out there, I'm very sorry, you're not fishing anymore. Uh, we've changed the description yeah. of what a fish is. <laughs> it can be anything. <laughs> you are now actinopterygian. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, just, I, I like how it kind of shows that nature and evolution isn't very neat. And we as, as humans, we have this obsession to kind of Everything. classify everything to my neat boxes but you can't always do that with evolution um but it is useful when you're talking about things to better define like different and groups it just shows like sort of how interconnected everything is and yeah it's, of, it's messy yeah. that's it's a mess what... it's messy but it's beautiful it evolution is, yeah. is beautiful. It's a beautiful mess exactly so um yeah now we're gonna show you what we got up to on the isle of Wight. we went to this locality called boldner which um Sorry, so, 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 what is OU? That's an Oxford University Natural History Museum. I don't know if that's actually the accession thing, but I just. Yeah, we're just going to show you what we got up to at, on the Isle of Wight at a locality called Boldner. Uh, we talked quite a bit in the video about everything uh, geology, yeah, the setting, geology. Uh, animals being found there. But it's a good site to find some fish. Um, well, you see which fish we find. Um, Amiads. Bit, yeah. Amiads. Well, the, the thing is, the reason why we went to Boldner. Um, compared to some of the other, compared to them, some of the southern sites of the mm. island was because of the recent storms. Um, we haven't had the best conditions to actually see the um, fish fossils because they come from the Vectis Formation. They're yeah. predominantly from the Vectis Formation on the Isle of Wight. Um, all of that was covered up um, during Storm Eunice, and due to our um, constant battering of storms, we hope. It is exposed, and I will be going down to the island to do some, to do scouting. some scouting <laughs> yeah. to see if it's all open. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure we record that when yeah. we go next. We're but, we're hoping to. Do and soon. to be honest, if we went to Vectis, we'd end up getting distracted by dinosaurs and oh, shark yeah. spines. Yeah, we would. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I got I got some sides. But the thing is that yeah, we went to Bolner. Um, it has I mean, a really, really diverse group of fishes there. Um, what, yeah, we what we think it's difficult to find much information on what is actually there. And it says that there are all these, um, this group called amiads, but there's probably a bit more there. Definitely some sharks. The problem is, is um, fish have all similar characteristics, as we spoke about earlier. Yeah, it's hard to kind of... You can't, it's, it's incredibly kind of tough to determine um, fish's vertebrae from one another. 
So that's why we group them in. As we said, we're trying our best not to group, but we group yeah. them into a, an animal called an amia. A amia, a so. Amia. Amia. Yeah. So, amia. Those are both fins. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'll talk about that in the video. So let's play that. Yeah, so we've come to Boldner on the north kind of side of the island and the deposits here are about 28 to 30 million years old. You find a lot of mammal remains, uh, lots of kind of alligators and the things we're interested in today, fish remains. Let's go fossil hunt. Yeah, so we may have misjudged the tides a little bit, slightly higher than we intended, but it should be going down. It just makes uh, this a bit interesting to traverse. But we'll make it. We'll be fine. Might get a bit wet. Look at this turtle I just found. So there's a bit of turtle carapace. Is that focusing? Yeah. Uh, and you can see there's these markings here, which are sort of like the suture marks but, um, on the carapace. It's also quite curved on the, the other side, so I think it might be an edge of, uh, of a bit of the shell. And then you can see it's really nice uh, te like bone texture, where the blood vessels would be. So yeah, we're going to end up with loads of these. Uh, first find of the day, not too bad. Still yet to find any fish, but yeah, it's a decent chunk. So what you see here are these logs. They have fallen from the vegetation above, but what the best thing about these logs are is that they are point banks. So they pick up sediment, trapping it. And while doing so, you can find bits of fossils. Now, right now I've just found four little bits, four or three little bits of um, turtle. And this is a turtle known as Emmys, the flat shell turtle. So, So this little patch here, when we've been to this spot before, I've managed to find some tiny, tiny vertebrae of fish. Uh, probably a type of fish called an amiad, uh, a single representative, single living representative of which today is the bowfin fish. So it's a basal kind of um, ray-finned fish. And uh, yeah, just like absolutely tiny verts I found amongst all of this, uh, this shingle. You have to get down on all fours and kind of look really closely. So that's what we're going to try and do now. See if we can find some fish, uh, maybe some teeth as well. Might give some sieving a go. We've brought some sieves. So we'll see if we can find some of these really tiny fossils. Oh, there we go. I actually found one. It's probably going to be way too small to see. I don't know if that's focusing at all. But that is an absolutely tiny fish vertebra. So you can see on one end, there's a kind of like a circular, um, circular section to it. And then it's quite elongated and then it looks like the other end has been broken off. So yeah, I mean, this is the sort of size you're talking about. Absolutely tiny in amongst all of this, this gravel. Um, yeah, I'll make sure to put this away quickly before we lose it. Nice. Found something. Okay, maybe we'll try some sieving. Yeah, what you got? Oh wow, that's a really nice one. Much bigger than the one I just found. Very nice. Probably a amiad. Again, seems to be what most things are here. Absolutely. Uh... Alienology. <laughs> yeah, so we've got these sieves here. We bought from our university, and uh, I've got five millimeters five millimeter and one millimeter size mesh. So it's a really good technique for finding small vertebrates. Um, one of our friends, uh, Eddie's used it for um, searching for his shark teeth for his dissertation. And so we're gonna try, try our luck and see if we can find some fish birds, some fish teeth by just using a trowel, digging through the sediment and uh, washing it out through here. 
see if it collects anything. So let's give that a go. So I don't know if it's probably not gonna pick up on the camera, but right there, it's actually worked. I have actually found one. So um, clearly there's quite a lot in this uh, sediment here, and this is a decent technique. I think I just need to get less sediment next time, just there's not as much to search through, but yeah, there's a really nice tiny one there. A tiny fragment of bone here. Um, almost looks like turf carapace, actually. Don't know if it's worth taking. It's just got that sort of texture. Could be um, the Trionyx genus, kind of rugos a little bit, or maybe a bit of a alligator scoot. Not sure. It's very small. Don't know if it's worth collecting. I don't see any clear vertebrae. So, stratigraphy of this area. This kind of bluey grey, um, mottly sort of textured clay uh, on, the, on the actual foreshore here is the upper Hampstead member of the Boldner Formation. And then in the cliff there, you can see the Cranmore member. Now the Cranmore member actually started out as a more, more brackish sort of environment that later turned into freshwater, while the Hampstead was more marine but with freshwater influences. Uh, on top of the Cranmore is actually some quaternary gravels but we're not really looking through that. Um, and these environments sort of, the comparison has been made to the Everglades of modern day Florida. Uh, so you're getting like crocodilians here, lots of fish, obviously, uh, a lot of different mammal species, including an interesting uh, gliding rodent called Eomis. Um, and so yeah, you can find all sorts of, of mammalian taxa in the rocks here. Um, and it's a really great place to find stuff. It's, it's mostly not in situ material. It's all, because this is all like, sliding a lot um, and so you often find it like just kind of loose on the foreshore but uh, yeah really good place to find a lot of different fossils what have you got a mammal jaw that's incredible that tooth is so nice I don't know if it's focusing properly. So where do you find it? Just found it probably about a few, probably about 100 meters that way. <laughs> was it in the It in was the in the sediment, the, literally. It was just in the sediment. On the Picked foreshore. it up and I was yeah. like, oh sugar, I've just found a limb bone. Look at it and there's a tooth sticking out right there. That is so and There's nice. another tooth in the socket. <laughs> probably work out, oh, it, oh, there's a wear facet and everything. You can probably figure out this is probably Bophryodon, the most common mammal from uh, Bulma. So, yeah. Got quite a nice bit of what is probably the turtle Trionyx. Go the carapace. So, right here, I just found another absolutely tiny fish vertebra. So, this is the, the top of the, the Hampstead member. Um, I don't know if it's come from within it itself. It was kind of just resting on the top, so it could have just uh, eroded out. But it's really nice. It's got seems to have all of the transverse processes still attached on one side at least. Absolutely tiny, so I don't want to lose it. I'll put it away now. Let's see if we can get some close-ups. Nice. Yeah, I just picked up this nice bit of uh, quite a big chunk of what's probably mammal bone, maybe reptile. It was just right here. Uh, so this is the site where we've actually found a really amazing um, mammal vertebra. Last time we were here, he found it. Um, not, still not sure what it is. It's currently being identified by the Oxford uh, Natural History Museum. But um, yeah, so this is the top of the, the Hampstead member. And um, yeah, look at that. You can very clearly see all of the, the bone texture, the holes for blood vessels, smooth surface, and then uh, another cut surface there. What have you just found? Another bit of bone. No idea if it's a mammal or a reptile. 
You can see the bone marrow texture squished between these two flat surfaces. That indicates the bone. Let's find more. Quick, say something smart about it. Um, this is a alligatoroid um, scoot, probably from Diplocyanodon hatiensis. This little bump of a ridge there, it's called the keel. This flat surface is the articulary surface for the next osteoderm to go on top. Nice, good find. <laughs> He's threatening me. Got evidence this now. Like this. Oh, thanks. Just got this back on top. For science. Salty. Okay, so we're back near the start now. Walked all the way back. I've just been searching in this little little area here where it's kind of collected next to the log. And again, managed to find a really nice fish, but well, you what did. we also found was what it looks like might be a modern or hopefully a few thousand year old um, mammalian tooth. Now we know that there has been archaeological finds here. So the at the end of the day, it would nice to be would nice to find a humanoid mm. tooth, but because of how many agricultural history this area has, it might just be a, another sheep yeah. or a cow. It's nice and like one and half though. It's yeah. Cool. So you need to take it to the lab. Yeah. But yeah, so Bolden is a really fantastic place to find fossils, especially of fish and wide variety of mammals. I mean, I found loads of turtles today, some stuff that could be, oh, alligator yeah. scoots. We've, uh, um, I found my mammal jaw. So this area is incredibly phosphoriferous for beginners and experts. Yeah, just make sure you get the tides right if yes, you do decide please. to come here. <laughs> we got on a really good day actually. Yeah. So that's just our luck. And dress correctly. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get very muddy, but it's been fun. Hope yeah. you enjoyed. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that video of our adventures at Boulder. It was a very fun fossil hunt, but sadly, Dark boy couldn't make it. He was feeling ill. Yeah, it was definitely. It was very sad. Um, yeah, you wanted to make a couple of corrections about some of the identifications. Yes. So in my hindsight, um, you're not always going to be correct in the field. Um, you're going to go off what your first judgment is. So when I found the hominid tooth, which is hominid, not humanoid, it's not alien. <laughs> so when I found the hominid tooth, um, it had the structure similar to um, pig teeth. And I have spoken to some other people who I know who are quite interested in uh, mammalian um, fossils. And apparently humans and pigs actually do have similar molars. And um, uh, what we do know was that there is a archaeological um, site just off the coast of Boldner. And this tooth could have come from there mm. because I don't think there's any farms nearby Boldner for... Yeah, when you, when you go down the path, like onto the beach, you, you see all these signs saying there's... Um... Iron Age or something? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, like, Iron um, Age. Yeah, just offshore. So it's pretty cool. You get a lot of stuff washed up. Sorry, <clears> I've <throat> just remembered the... I forgot to look up the location. Uh, but yeah, you, you were pretty sure it is a, just a pig tooth. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, a, it's a swine tooth. Yeah. Okay. Swine. <laughs> Sorry, pig tooth. God damn it. Why are you insulting <laughs> it like that? And then there was also the, the mammal tooth. Is that what you were checking? No, the mammal jaw. So we mammal found. Jaw, yeah. So we found out that yes, Bophryodon is the most common uh, mammal down at um, Boldner, but it's actually not um, Bophryodon. Bophryodons are like a big hippo. Cool. Mm. Um, it's actually a little small um, marsupial jaw. Um, I'm just getting the identification. Yeah, so we've actually got uh, some of the fossils here, and I'm just going to get some close-ups on. Oh, the old they're not. They're not GoPro. the theorem. I think that was the other the other yeah. bone which we're also so, going to talk about. Yeah, I'll talk we, about that. I'll talk about that in a bit. We'll have a look at these first. So, um, I'll add this in in post. But yeah, we've got uh, some of the fossils that we found. So you can see here, um, our is not focusing very well, but our haul of um, fish vertebrae. So some of the larger ones I think you found just in the sediment, and then uh, some of the really really tiny ones. I think that's the first one I found right there, um, and then the others were were found from the sieving. 
Um, that's the the Trionix. Um, scoot, yeah. Scoot for yeah, the carapace. And these two didn't actually find these. And looks so weird. <laughs> didn't actually find these on the um on that trip. But this is a bit of uh. Alligator jaw. Yeah. So yeah, that is the um that is the uh, angular it's the back of the dentary. Yeah. Of uh, an alligator um the lower jaw. So that's some of the, some of the other things that you can find, and then this is an alligator vertebra, which is a very nice find of mine. Very happy. Yeah, as I said in the video, um, this alligator is known as Diplocyndon hatiensis. Um, it's probably the most common alligator down there. You can find teeth, but sadly we didn't actually find any teeth that day. Yeah. Um, we finally, finally, what we might think we have the identification of the marsupial jaw. It's called Ampiparatherium. Small little, um, small little rodent. But, um, <clears throat> a metatherium. It's a, uh, a paratherium. A what? Paratherium. <laughs> if, if it's, uh, like a kind of marsupial ancestor, well, that's what you said. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so I think, uh, it's going to be like a metatherium or something. Um. Yeah, just while you do that, we've also got, yeah, probably the nicest bit of turtle carapace I've found. You can see on this side, it has this whole uh, like smooth edge, and that's like actually the, the side of the carapace. That is really nice. None of this is focusing. Carapace is top one, isn't it? It's just shut off. Uh, yes, it is. I don't know why that's happened, but yeah, you got some close. Carapace um, plastron. Plastron is on the board. Yeah, it's metatherium. metatherium. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's a really nice find. Um, okay, it's actually still going. One thing I would like to discuss, uh, I don't actually have the fossil with me right now. It's currently with the Oxford Museum of Natural History. Um, and that's, that's the one I mentioned in the video. So we've, we've got some images we yeah. can put up, but it's, yeah. The fossil would be, uh, I'll be getting the fossil tomorrow. Oh, yeah. sorry, I'll be getting As it soon. I'll, I'll, I'll be recording. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be getting the fossil soon. Um, the identification was done by the Oxford Museum and the Natural History Museum in London by Dr. Neil Adams. And we think that the vertebra is actually from um, an lopotherium. An lopotherium is like this... Um, it's an ungulate? Yeah, it's a basal, yeah. Is it a basal camel. Or, or, or like, that's what you said, yeah. yeah, they say it's a basal camel, so they, it's a lumbar vertebra, so one of the, the far back vertebrae of the animal. But, um, so, which one is it? Further down, further down. Further. So, I'm assuming it's some kind of um, artiodactyl. Yes, it's, it's, you it's, yes, it's an artiodactyl. You don't have to yeah. switch them. It but, is, um, yeah, herbivorous artiodactyl mammal. Isn't um, one, yeah, I was going to say one of them's at Crystal Palace, <clears> isn't it? Yes. Oh, is it one they've made the yeah, model? Yeah, one of the models. Oh, awesome. So, one thing, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what's interesting is that um, it's quite an important fossil, so um, there will be discussions of donating the specimen or um, further research done on it. Yeah, it was yeah, it was beautiful. Like probably the best thing any of us have ever found at Boulder. Yeah, it has to be. Um, but we we'll get in a video soon. We will. Yeah, so we're actually we'll talk about this a bit more later. But we're going up to Oxford um, nearby tomorrow for my some of my dissertation work and also to uh, to talk to someone. About that find? Yes. Um, so, yeah. We'll, we'll make sure to record some of that and uh, put it in here. All right, so we're going to move on to some of the, the recent paleontological news. Um, there's been quite a few nice studies uh, recently. This is one you wanted to talk about. Yeah, this is, um, and I was really interested, interested in, this is Belezia gracilis. Um, already known um, species of uh, squam uh, stem squam squamate. Discovered in 1998 in England. They discovered a jaw, but until recently, they was there was a new specimen. So we have a seventy percent complete skeleton discovered in the Isle of Skye. The specimen comes from the Kilimung Formation. Uh, measured about six to seven centimeters. The new specimen, as I said, it's seventy percent complete. So the mm. front of the half of the animal is missing and the tail is missing. But this is a really, really interesting specimen um, because it's. It provides a snapshot, as some articles will say, in the development and origin of very important specimens. Uh, sorry. Provides uh, a snapshot in the development of um, snakes, lizards, and amphisbanians. Yeah, so, the squamates. Yeah, so the squamates. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a squamate. This is part of the stem squamate groups. So you may know um, uh, fossils such as 
Oculodentavis, <laughs> and this is not going to be a nice uh, pronunciation. Hugh 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 Zibil? Hugh Hugh Quetzpalli? Yeah, that sounds uh, that's right. a mouthful. But um, this, um, so Belarusia gracilis has allowed for these two other fossils to um, build stem squamata group. Um, because we didn't know when the, those two uh, fossils actually place in phylogeny, as we spoke about earlier. Oculodentavis is a bird. Yeah. Sorry, I'm joking. I, I don't know oh, if you've no. seen my, um, my video on that. It was the Myanmar yeah. amber specimen that they, well, they described. A bird, but... Described in nature as a, like the world's smallest Mesozoic dinosaur. They thought it was a tiny bird. And uh, <clears> the <throat> paper was retracted. <laughs> they realized it was a squamate. And also probably illegally obtained <laughs> or like you know ob obtained in a pretty dodgy manner so yeah anyway yeah but yeah what i was gonna say is what's amazing about this um new discovery from the isle of sky is the special char specialized characteristics um that are seen in modern squamates so you have the brain case the ankle and the knee joints and they're similar in belarusia and um uh, modern squamata mm. but um what i found what was really really interesting was this the cranium the skull this animal has uh has the ability of cranial kinesis so this means that the individual parts of the jaw and skull move independently of each other this allows the animal to swallow larger prey and that's quite similar to what we see in snakes they just take the mm. the, the lower jaw to swallow um uh, bigger prey, so like I know constrictors do that. Some mosasaurs. Yes, yeah, some well, mosasaurs are known to do yeah. that because they have the palatine teeth, don't they, to hold mm. down prey. So I thought this would be. I thought this was a really interesting fossil. Yeah, um, we can Quite pull close up the, to home as well. You could the, say the paper if you want to switch to that. Um, has it got some nice figures? I haven't really looked through this. I mean, really, really good figures. Oh yeah. Can't access it. <laughs> Subscribe to Nature, but oh yeah, we've done a lot of e scanning then. Look at that fossil. Awesome. Yeah, so she, the lady who found it, she only uh, she noticed the front was the skull. So she put it under a microscope. She saw the teeth. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's nice. Wow. The, the specimen is absolute tiny. Yeah, it's a absolute what, like tiny. Seven centimeters. Yeah, so they that's think crazy. the animal. I think they measured the animal itself, not the full reconstruction, to be about sixty-seven centimeters. So a really tiny little um, fossil there. Mm. Well, this is another one. You yeah, want I'm going to talk, talk about. about. So. Acoustic communication is a pretty posh way of saying talking. Um, <laughs> so, turns out, I mean, this is really interesting because, like, I didn't know much about um, the evolution of acoustic communication, communication before this. I sort of just thought it just arose, like, um, in one group and then throughout all of the tetrapods and everything. Um, but, yeah, no, this paper really shed some light on it because it turns out before this paper, it was considered that um, it was actually convergent, like, um, Acoustic communication arose in different groups independently, um, because like, uh, because like, there's loads of animals. Like, you would have thought, oh, if it rose, uh, from one, then it would all, all animals would have the capability to do it. Yeah. But it turns, but what this paper does is, it actually uh, pre presents evidence for 53 species of, uh, turtles and lungfish, um, stadiums, tuataras, so those are sphenodonts, um shows that they actually do have the aptitude for acoustic communication, like they, they can either actually do make noise, a bit weird how that missed us, or <laughs> they can, like, receive, like, they understand uh, communication. Um, how did they figure that out? Oh, paper. Wait, so is this, um, they're uh, saying that it's, it evolved once and was secondarily lost, or, like... Yeah. Okay. It's, it seems to be as, um... Yeah, uh, a lot of it was literature based as well. So they okay. specifically tested fifty three, okay. and then uh, an an extra fifty odd where um, through the literature that they updated, and then they all combined it into a um, uh, phylogenetic oh, wow. analysis. Yeah. to find that actually uh, is it arose at four hundred and seven billion years yeah, ago. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's like, like so. It's so, it's always been there and then just yeah, lost in the ancestral it's form. basically. Uh, fish, <laughs> as we were talking about earlier. So is this, it's oh, this is with the episode. This is a Clycillian. Yeah. So, but another, yeah. yeah, another thing, well, another line, line of evidence that um they used apart from you know this phylogenetic analysis is that um uh in all animals that do use acoustic communication, 
it's the same part of the brain every time. Mm. So that links up. But yeah, I think the next point of interest is like, where can this study go next? Because well, you've shown that it can go back 407 million. Can it go back any further? Like, can, can we yeah. trace it back to the origin of vertebrates? Because it, it says does. pollinates, like, 407 is it's a long time ago. It's a lot earlier than a lot of stuff we were talking about earlier. Yeah, it does just say at least as old as the last common. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know how you'd reconstruct it, 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 that from test. fossils. Yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. Yeah. Um, so that was the uh, acoustic communication. Another interesting thing, which I did cover in Seven Days of Science, but I just wanted to mention again. Unacceptable. <laughs> was the, um, the description of this new South African lager start. Um, which, uh, whenever I pronounce this word, I always get comments from... I, I always get comments from German people, um, like, saying I'm not saying it right, so... You're, you're in for that as well. Okay. We did actually have to do some presentations on some lager starter recently. Uh, we, we could talk about those in an episode, it'd be quite interesting. The Herefordshire lager start. I said it differently again that time. But yeah, this, this, uh, this new South African one, it's from the Mid-Permian. Yeah, so interestingly for the Karoo Basin, um, this middle Permian site actually preserves plants and insects. So it, it, the paper just explains how usually um, from this time in the Permian in South Africa, you have a really good um, vertebrate fossil record that's been studied quite a bit, but the invertebrates and the plants uh, were virtually unknown. And so there's some, there's just some nice figures of some of the exceptionally well-preserved plants. Oh, wow. Some of the exceptionally well preserved insects have been found here. And uh, yeah, like a nice paleo environmental uh, paleo art, like full reconstruction of the site. They say it's a yeah, lakeshore ecosystem in um, really, Might be really a good like detail. Forest. Yeah, I think it could be. I haven't read exactly how it's preserved, but I'm assuming it could be uh, like, is it uh, dinoflagellates? Oh, what, the um, like, microbial an... mats. Yeah, the algae. Yeah, yeah. That, that's how. Morrison was preserved, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah, uh, pyroclastic flows. That's it. Yeah, I'm. I'm assuming it might be something similar to that. I don't know if they've talked nice. much about the preservation. Awesome. Yeah, they're just kind of reporting on on the, uh, the finds that have been made here. So that's a really nice paper. One of the authors is uh, Bruce Rubich, who I met in South Africa. He's a really nice guy. He was the director of. Um, the Evolutionary Studies Institute for a while, uh, and he's retired now. Um, if you watch some of my South Africa videos, eventually go an interview with him. Great guy. Um, and yeah, he's just involved in a lot of South African discoveries. So this is a really, yeah, a really interesting paper. Uh, the other thing, I think we'll skip this one for now. Other thing I wanted to talk about. Ah, uh, it has to be done. It has to be done. Is the, uh, this new ichthyosaur paper by uh, Dean Lomax and Judy Masseri, which I think I was pronouncing correctly. Um, but yeah, they managed... So basically, uh, one of the first ichthyosaur fossils to be introduced to the scientific community was this one that uh, Sir Everard Holm, who was actually born in Hull. Or, wait, let me check that. I think he... Something to do with Hull. <laughs> let me just double check. I remember I was That'd looking at... Uh, born in Hull, yeah. I was right. Um, but basically he introduced it, and in 1819, uh, he, he gave it the name Proteosaurus, but that, oh. that actually takes priority over Ichthyosaurus. And it had like a hyphen in the name, it's really weird. But, um, oh, I've heard of it, you've spoken to me Yeah, this. But, but obviously everyone started using Ichthyosaurus instead. Um, but yeah, so it was found in, the, it was in the collection of Colonel Birch, who obviously bought a lot from Mary Anning, so it was probably collected by Mary Anning herself. Um, and then, yeah, it was, so it's a pretty historically significant fossil being one of the first complete ichthyosaurs to be uh, described. And then it went to the collection of the Royal College of Surgeons in London, and then was uh, destroyed in a bombing raid in World War II. Now, that means all that remained of it for quite a while was just this drawing. I'm not sure if it was done by... Uh, I don't know if it says... William uh, Clift. William Clift. Um, and so, yeah, that's all they had for a while. But then Dean and uh, his colleague actually managed to find two casts, two plastic casts 
of this specimen, one of them in the Peabody Museum at Yale University in the US, and the other in the Berlin Natural History Museum. So it just shows that, yeah, they, they were able to look at these casts, which were obviously like made directly from the original specimen, even though there was no record of these casts having been made. Um, and it showed details that were sort of changed slightly in the illustration because they were actually made from the fossil itself. They could show exactly what it looked like. Um, and so, yeah, they just talk about how it's therefore very important when you find these uh, old historical casts in museum collections that can reveal a lot about these historical specimens that might no longer actually exist. So it's pretty amazing. Does this um, specimen take priority over, does it make it the holotype? I don't think it's used as it was used as a holotype. I think it was just, just a cast anyway. Like, yeah, really they're, they're more likely to refer to the neotype or lexotype. Yeah, I'm not sure what the Ichthyosaurus holotype itself is. Probably one of Marianning's specimens. Um, so no, the Temnodontosaurus in NHM is the holotype. Yeah, of the Temnodontosaurus um, genus, and that was the one that famously Joseph discovered. Found, wasn't it? Well, Joe's um, finding a Marianning. Yeah, uh, yeah. Found. And that Marianning prepared and everything. Um, yeah, it just shows how important these are. And they also say that there might be unrecognized casts of this particular specimen um, in museums in the UK, possibly, if, you know, at least two casts of it were made. It means the other ones would be out there. So that's pretty cool. Pretty exciting. I'm really interested in why the casts weren't documented. Yeah, that's weird. Because mm -hmm. that's just why people thought, oh, it must be lost. And only refer During to the bombing documentation drawing. could have been destroyed. Yeah, maybe. But it was in America and in Germany. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's about all the news we wanted to cover. There's probably going to be some huge discoveries to miss, and we'll talk about next time. Um, but yeah, I thought it'd be interesting if we all sort of talked about the research we're doing ourselves, so our, our dissertation projects. Uh, I can go first, if you want. Um, Main man, bang. Yeah, we've got some images to show. We'll, we'll add those in post, though. So basically what I'm studying is the specimen of an ichthyosaur. Uh, the exact genus is unknown for sure, but probably uh, this, this ichthyosaur called Grendelius. Hopefully it's Grendelius mordax, because it has the coolest name, and I want it to be that. <laughs> what have you ever speak? Russian something out. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ru Russian species names, but yeah. Um, so will this be the first British... Specimen of a mm. Russian ichthyosaur. No, because Grindelius mordax is known from Britain. Oh, okay. But it's, uh, so the Cambridge Clay Formation, so it's late Jurassic. And um, yeah, it's this really awesome specimen. It's on display in a town called Abingdon, which is not too far from Oxford. And it was found in a clay pit near to the town back in the 80s. Uh, it's got decent... Hopefully you can't hear the rain. It's just picked up again. It's got some decent documentation of like the whole history of how it was found. Um, I've been trying to work out which ammonite zone it's from. Hopefully I might get to go into the pit, trying to, trying to organize all of that. Um, but yeah, the main thing that's really interesting about it, and which was shown in some of the images, is these like crazy healed bite marks on its jaws, on its, uh, its dentaries and its premaxillae, so the, the, the bones that make up the actual jaws in ichthyosaurs. Um, there's like these huge excavations with all this like rugos bone texture around it so it's clearly had like a huge chunk of its of its jaws taken out and then um healed around that and there's these uh sort of what look like blood vessel textured textures to the bone and so my supervisor um our professor thinks it might be where the bone has sort of like grown into the soft tissue surrounding it and like imprinted some of the the blood vessels and yeah so so we think it might is probably grandelius but one of the things I'm also going to be doing is hopefully running a phylogenetic analysis and trying to figure out if this is Grindelius or if it's something new, which possibly it could be. The material's fairly complete, which is always nice, but it's missing a basic occipital. Um, a lot of the, material is in storage. Yeah, there's that as well. So, so the basic occipital is this, like the very back of the skull bone, and it's very useful in identifying ichthyosaur. It's used in the taxonomy a lot, but it, the humerus. Two humeri are there. It's got one femur preserved that we know of, mm -hmm. and a lot of the forelimb digits, which are all things in buying ichthyosaurs. Um, and yeah, so it was like a month ago, I think. Got some images of when we went up to um, the storeroom for yeah, the museum. September. Yeah. yeah. So there's a storage, an off-site storage room 
for the museum where it's kept. And it turns out there's actually a lot more material that's not on display of my specimen. Um, so we went and investigated that and we found quite a bit more film material, loads more vertebrae. They're yeah. just like in these boxes in storage. So, some, sadly, some pyrite. Yeah, but it's not too bad. Uh, it's not bad, but the um, problem is these, these skull bones are so splintered, so fractured, so like small, it's just impossible to say where they yeah. actually piece. If someone had the time and a few years to actually piece every single bit together, yeah, I don't they could think probably there's... get a complete skull. <laughs> Possibly. But... Possibly. It, I don't think they're going to end up like putting any of these the, the storage bones on display. It'd be nice if they did, but I've got some images of it, and hopefully we can identify some, some nice ribs as well, some are. with some odd pathologies. Yeah, so I noticed one of the ribs, and I'll, I'll put a photo of that as well. Um, actually, has it's like bent at the end, but it's not. So the ribs come in sections from where they've been like shattered during preservation, then glued back together during the the preparation process. Uh, but this one of the ribs has like a bit of break and heal, and it just kind of bends a bit at the end, so that's definitely a pathology, pretty sure. But this beast has definitely um, gone through hell. It's been through a lot. <laughs> it's and, been yeah. through a lot, yeah. And like my supervisor, one of the things my supervisor said is that it might be like a really old individual that's just been been through a lot and has all this pathologies, these injuries. What I found... Can't wait to tell, cut it open. <laughs> we, yeah. we hopefully will not be doing that, but no. what I found really interesting was that the limbs are absolutely tiny compared to the size of the skull of this animal yeah so we we tried to do some estimates of how big the skull is we, it's massive. The, the thing with this the, with how it's displayed is that it's in a, a glass case and they can't take the glass off unless the museum is closed so we're recording this on a sunday tomorrow is monday the museum is closed on mondays and so they can actually take the glass off on a monday so that's what we're going to head up and do tomorrow hopefully i can get some nice some nicer photos without all the glass reflecting and do some actual measurements of all of the uh, these elements. And I found a really good paper that goes through like all these individual character traits for ichthyosaur bones and just um, shows what to look for. So I can hopefully look through that and code it in a phylogenetic analysis. That's my plan for tomorrow. And I'm very, very excited. excited to see the bite marks. Yeah, so really we'll make sure to record to some of that and we can talk about it in the next episode. That's kind of where I am now. Also doing like a literature review of the Cambridge clay ichthyosaurs. And um, yeah, hopefully, I, you know, done some field work over the summer, looking at the uh, the Cambridge clay type locality in Dorset. Yeah, doing the stratigraphy, and yeah, that's my that's my project. Looking at this injured ichthyosaur, trying to work out how it how it got like this, um, and um, yeah, trying to work out what the ichthyosaur is. I'm also hoping to do some three D scans of the bones and put those into to Blender, the Blender software, hopefully. And see if I can do stuff with that. At the end of the day, it yeah. would be a paleontologist undergrad or postgrad's dream to discover a new species <laughs> or genus. So, fingers yeah. crossed, it would be I mean, nice. Obviously, this would it, be a nice. If it is something new, that's not something I'll be able to publish. Why? Well, I mean, people have done collection. that. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't like name it as something new for my und my undergraduate project. It'd be like future research. Mm. Which hopefully, I could be. But that's yeah. That's kind of what I'm doing, why I want to be Ichthys. So. <laughs> so comparing it to Grandelius, yeah. what sort of characters are you? Um, Grandelius, I, I'll need to go through the actual uh, like specific shapes of all the bones, but Grandelius is quite notable for having like pretty robust uh, jaws and quite like, I think one of the things that's notable about it is like the back of the skull is quite stout. It probably had quite a powerful bite. Definitely like a top predator of the Yeah, you got some teeth Jurassic there as well. Oceans. There are a few teeth that are really not well preserved. I think it's only the crowns that aren't any bases, but that's another thing that like I haven't been able to get up close to those. Look at that tomorrow. Could there be a diagnostic between the teeth between each each? Yeah, species? that's another of the things in this character list. Look at the teeth and um, how kind of like they have a thing called plicodentine, which is this like fluting yes uh, they, they um, sit in the socks don't they oh. yeah and then also like how bow shaped the the bases are compared to the crowns mm. that's another thing to look at but i think it's only crowns fortunately but they're really tiny teeth yeah they are I, 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 the I, i've seen the skull and you, we'll yeah. see we'll show photographs but it, big skull big 
Maybe we can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's what I was going to say. The, the skull is probably at least a meter long. Possibly but that's more. what's on display. Um, yeah. We have to remember that, for example, the bits of the denture could be missing. Pre-max, I don't, uh, pre-maxilla could not be fully complete. The back of the skull we don't fully have. So. Yeah, but it's, I mean, there's enough there to probably work out roughly what it is. Yeah, just measure, uh, measure up the bone size of yeah, the bones. Yeah, that's what we're going to be doing a lot tomorrow. So. Yeah, so uh, yeah. do you want to maybe explain what ammonites since you mentioned that? Earlier? Yeah, that's true. So in the Kimmeridge clay, there's just a lot of... Um, you can find a lot of ammonites at various levels in the stratigraphy. And ammonites are ideal for use as uh, biozone fossils because they're quite easy to identifiable anatomy. They evolve quickly and they're... Well, they are widely distributed, but I think in the Kimmage clay, they're actually quite endemic, like different areas where they're specific to that geographical zone. Interesting. Yeah, I remember reading a bit. But um, yeah, basically, if you find like a certain ammonite species with the fossil, you can identify where specifically in, in the formation it came from. So, so I remember one thing um, the museum had said to us, and the people who had sorted out the bones in the off-site storage unit as um, we, we don't know if ammonites were actually preserved with it. Yeah, so that's one of the problems. But with, they did say there were ammonites found in the area, and that mm. there's a whole separate box full of ammonites, but there's about four or five boxes just labelled ammonites. Yeah, so, so we, we one of those there. ammonites could have come from Ben's specimen, but they never actually labelled. So we, if you really want to look at the ammonite zones, you would have to go through each individual box and see what ammonite code, what, like, yeah. what the name is. And if it matches with your specimen. Yeah, so that's that's what I need. I need to try it. So that the the main problem is that the actual gravel pit that my specimen came from has now been flooded over. So I can't access the original pit it came from. But there are like a whole load of pits in the area that might be accessible. But now it's become a bit complicated because they're also being flooded. Um, and especially over winter, I don't think I'll be able to access them. Um, and also the stratigraphy is a bit messy there. It's not clear. There's also a few fault lines, apparently. You can definitely see there's it. been backfilling in um, yeah. sediments. When Ben and I took a trip down to some of the other pits and we saw um, some diggers um, moving a lot of sediment into the pits, so they've definitely backfilled a lot of yeah. it. There's a few challenges, but it's, it's exciting, and there's still a lot I can do. I just have to write 9,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, uh, oh, next. Eddie, take a look. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, as probably mentioned before, we're doing sharks. So, very cool. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I'm looking at um, uh, comparing these two different sites. So, Walton Lemonade over in Essex and Abbey Wood, part of London. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so they're Eocene in age, about uh, Euprisian or Eocene. I heard. think it's named after the. Yeah, it's named after Belgium. Place France, but, or, or Belgium even. Is that the one with the pregnant horse? Or am I thinking of Messel? You're Messel. thinking of Messel. Oh, never mind then. But, That's Germany. Yeah, Eocene, so it's around... Abbey Wood's about 55 million years old. I think uh, Walton is about a million years after that. So yeah. it's they're fairly close in age, to be honest. <laughs> um, and I've collected basically a lot of shark teeth, about 130 from Walton and Aze, and I don't know, like 300 from uh, Abbey Wood. I'm not sure on the total number yet. And I'm looking to compare the two. So I've got roughly 11 species between the two. I mean, mostly consisting of Stratolamia macrota, because that thing's over, and Silvestri Lamia There we go. Um, yeah, um, looking at sort of uh, differences in diversity, because Abbey Wood seems to be like a tidal, like, um, of a marine place, like you got um, fresh real and fresh water stuff washing in. Um, not re I haven't read too much on Ottoman A's yet, but that seems to be fairly marine as well. Um, yeah, comparing the diversity between the two, I think roughly they've got a similar number. Well, Abbey Wood might have uh, one or two more. Um, but I'm going to do some statistical tests with that. Uh, to see if there is actually a significant difference, and it'll be interesting to see if there is because mm. then it's like, okay, why? Why is there a different? Is it the environment? What was different between the two? Um, but also comparing the size of the sharks, especially since a lot of the species do cross over, but yeah, got a lot of the same species as well. 
So if I can compare the sizes as well, then whether, whether that's a point of interest as well. Um, but, so yeah, we've got... Yeah, I'll have to put up some photos later, but got some really nice looking teeth. Some are a bit gritty, <laughs> <laughs> completely broken, but uh, I've spent a long time now identifying them. I've gone over them like three times. I mean, because, well, that's the point. I mean, yeah, the main study you're focusing on is a lot of maths, but if I don't get my identification right, then that all becomes skewed. Yeah. So that's, that's what I've spent a lot of most time on. Um, I've got like, 3,000 words now written on just the systematics. So that's going through and like finding uh, someone's description of the original species and like correlating that to my own description. So going, okay, this has um, a full cutting edge crown. Okay. And then I write about my diagnosis. Then in my description, I'm like, okay, on this specimen, I can see a full cutting edge. That's why I've identified this shark into this species. Um, that's what I'm currently doing. I've only got a couple more species to do, and then I'll be moving on to getting some good photos. Some of the teeth are really tiny, um, so I think I'm going to put them under the scanning electron. Nice, and um, beautiful photos from. Yeah, yeah. well, it so it makes it look more professional. It's, you might see some stuff that you couldn't before, but some of my other teeth are big, so they'll just. Is but we have this technique called image stacking. So it's where you take an image at one angle and then you slightly turn it at a different angle and take it again, you keep doing that, and then you put those all on top of each other. It essentially makes an image where none of it is out of focus, it's all in focus. It's, yeah, it just makes a nicer looking image. Yeah. Yeah, so um and after that I just got hopefully all the maths to do. <laughs> all right. Yeah, and if you want to see some behind the scenes of the process of collecting. And there is the uh, the Shark Week video we did. Was it the sharks when sharks swam over London? I yeah, think something like that. Yeah. I need more views than him. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's that's what's just everyone loves the ROI. I lo I'm good at my, what I do. I think it's because it had dinosaurs in it quite yeah. as well. To be... but yeah, no. It was, like it was I said, cool I'm good at what I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'm happy with it so far. Yeah. Did you want to talk about your project? Yes. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's my turn for the project. Um. So I'm working on a small little crocodile from the Isle of Wight. It is part of the Wessex Formation. So um, stratigraphy-wise, we've figured out it's actually at the boundary. It, it, it's, it's a bit below the boundary of the Vectis Formation, which is the rocks above the Wessex. So it dates to 125 million years ago. Um, what is really interesting is um, this little crocodile is called uh, Cumpiodonchosuchus aprosodocati, which means um, nice. it, uh, it means button tooth crocodile, because when Sweetman, Steve Sweetman from the Isle of Wight and University of Portsmouth described it in 2015, we found that um, the teeth are durophagus and that the teeth are also heterodont. So what those terms mean, heterodont means that the teeth changes gradually throughout the jaw. Durophagid or durophagus teeth are crushing teeth. So you would expect a lot of fish and a lot of um, marine reptiles have these crushing dentition. So um, my specimen um, found, like I said, in the Wessex. And the Wessex is filled with gastropods, so these small um, snails and mollusks that the animal would just crush to eat the organism. So um, Steve Sweetman described the skull perfectly. But I'm. I've taken a step. For, I've taken a step beyond that now. Um, uh, this animal has not been described from a skeleton. I'm working on the first skeleton from the Isle of Wight or anywhere in the UK of this animal. So I'll be describing describing each individual bone. I've almost finished with the bones. Um, I've just got the skull to work on, and due to the preservation it's in, the skull is completely crushed. So um, I'm having a really tough time with that. And, um, yeah, so I'm just having a lot of fun. Uh, my end goal is to describe all the bones. Then I will be, um, uh, I will be doing a skeletal reconstruction because this is the first time anyone will finally see what this animal looks like. We've described this animal as a very basal, um, just a very basic, uh, little crocodile. From what I've researched, um, there's a few changes coming away. Uh, coming along, and um, 
I, hopefully, because I'm really into my paleo art, I would like to do a paleo art as well for my Yeah, so I'm the more of a uh, biological side, not the math side. <laughs> do one for me as well. No. <laughs> How much? Yeah. I'm more of the uh, biological description side of paleontology. So um, hopefully there's, there's some maths. I, I would say now what I absolutely love about the specimen, some of the bones are really clear. And I've taken nice photographs, I've drawn the specimen out, and um, that's what they expect you to do when you do dissertation. You need to take lots of photographs, drawings, you know, everything you can. And those are the qualities that will make you a good paleontologist. Yeah, like the amount of bad uh, images yeah. Yeah. and drawings. Just always remember, just, just, it's always good to have a figure of a drawing and a photograph so people can see what you're looking at at the same time. Because the image could be bad, but the drawing could be amazing. I think that's also emphasized by, well, the ichthyosaur stuff earlier, because, I mean, well, that specimen was yeah, destroyed. Yeah, the difference between what was the well, mark yeah. and the... Yeah. The, the specimen was destroyed, but we got the drawings. It's, it's, it's like a lot of specimens that are destroyed. If, if you've got a good drawing, you can work off that sometimes. Yeah, but um, I'm looking at uh, other crocodiles, so I've compared about um, 14 to 16... Oh, yeah, about 14 to 16 other crocodilians. So, um, I forgot to mention, my crocodile is a part of a group called Neosuchia. Are uh, the more um, basal and the um, group of crocodiles that actually have living relatives, so um, which goes into our modern day crocs, so the extant crocs. There's another group called um, Neo Notosuchia, which are the ab abnormal um, chimeric looking animals. So they they're very very weird. You've got crocodiles that have molars like humans, crocodiles that have teeth designed to eat plants. You have ones running on their hind legs. They're incredibly, they're just bizarre animals. And we could do a whole episode on oh, crocodile That would be amazing. But yeah, um, I've, seen some comparis I've seen some comparisons between them and my specimen. And um, hey, now I'm really excited to hopefully present it to the world. Yeah, but yeah, that's what I'm working on. It's really, really cool because hopefully, I mean, with our projects at least, hopefully end up publishing on them yes. eventually. Uh, if things go well and um yeah the main thing we've got to focus on like right now i'd say is uh we've got to do like a presentation in december i think the main thing about the dissertation i've liked is um sort of just being able to work on my own and do my own research like, yeah that's something i've really enjoyed in my own work yeah because doing doing youtube stuff like i've always done it's kind of reporting on other people's work and sort of like putting a lot of other people's studies together to talk about what we currently know about a group of animals but yeah it's been fun doing my own like actual research hopefully making a contribution eventually to the science so, you can report on it yeah exactly <laughs> and i'll definitely be talking about it seven days of science yeah if it gets um, published yeah so that was that's what we're doing as students yeah um yeah so i think the, the last thing we wanted to talk about was um we yeah portsmouth is near to another city called southampton um, here on the south coast and they actually have this this big shopping center and for some reason they have a genuine specimen of an allosaurus on display there this this privately owned specimen owned by the richmond group which i think is a, a charity um and they've loaned it to the shopping center and myself and producer charlie over there went to visit it the other day um and we yeah we got to see it and it's it's incredible it's Fairly, fairly big, and they say it's um one of the, yeah one of the largest and most complete allosaurus specimens, uh found in Wyoming in 2015 and excavated over the course of two years. It's now on loan to West Key, which is the name of the shopping center. Um and yeah, it's got these really cool pathologies noticed on the ribs. There's this huge um like callus formation, um quite quite on its uh, left side, quite high up on the rib, um. Quite, there's a few from the images you showed me. Yeah, it, quite, it looks like, like a series others. of um, of broken ribs. Yeah, and something noted by uh, paleontologist Darren Nash, who's been to see it, he on Twitter about how the the hornlets along the top of the skull are actually quite interesting and unlike anything he's seen in other specimens. Um, there's actually like kind of three groups of them. So there's like the main main horns above the eye, mm. and there's one above the antorbital fenestra. It's, it's really Difficult to explain, but we've got photos. Um, it's, yeah, very odd, uh, complex also, structures. Photos you showed me, the pre maxilla looks a bit different. 
Oh, that I saw pictures of seeing. Oh, is that that fun? Yeah. Bit? Yeah, pre- yeah, pretty yeah. much it. So, I mean, yeah, you see here, there's a pretty weird structure going on there. Yeah. And then, um, like another yeah, cluster yeah, over the... Sh- the... like quad bumps there. Yeah, the, um, but the ones above the eyes, they're quite broad, aren't they? Like, yeah. You, you look at other allosaur specimens, oh, yeah, they're yeah, quite yeah. pointed and a bit narrow, but... Now I remember what you said about the premaxilla. Um... But yeah, I mean, if, if you happen to be near Southampton, definitely go and give that a visit. It's worth seeing. I don't know how much longer it'll be there. Um, I thought it was only going to be because of Jurassic World's Dominion. That's kind of when it appeared, around when that came out. Still there. It's worth going to go and see. Um, and I think that's about it. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going a bit longer Long than time waiting. Yeah, yeah, so so again, this is kind of an experiment. Let us know what you think. Please do give us suggestions for what we can do. And we need some name suggestions as well. You're really useful. Um, I know there's probably the audio might not be highly uh, brilliant all of the time. <laughs> We've been having some issues with that. We're but not, uh, some movies too. Yeah, over the course of the next few episodes, I'm sure we're going to um, sort it out. So that. So Our producer's be... going to put us in check. Yeah, exactly. He looks like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, yes. so we were thinking actually we might do a sort of vote on what the next episode topic. So we, we want as much. <laughs> yeah, maybe not straight away. I think we were going to give some suggestions. I don't think we got ideas yeah. for them yet. But we're, we're going to put up a, a poll. Uh, we want to include the audience as much as possible. Um, so let us know what you'd like us to cover next. And again, just any, any suggestions for segments and stuff. We're obviously going to record bits of our adventure to Oxford and Abingdon uh, tomorrow. Yes. Um, we are also, said. depending on the polls, mm. uh, I'm going to remember to sneak in a few fossil hunts. Yes, so, uh, definitely some of those. my way of getting into the field and uh, <laughs> just showing you guys what um, fossil hunting is like for myself, Ben mm. and Eddie. Yeah, it'd be, be nice after all these storms to go check out Isle of Wight again. Yeah, yeah I, I got a few nice like stuff. I should know. I know. I know, <laughs> I know a few like well, We know the spots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, we really hope you enjoyed this and uh, let us know your feedback. Thank you. See ya. Bye. <laughs>